But the question I want to ask us this morning, uh, starting there in Ephesians chapter 6 and looking at that text for the main section of our lesson is, where does our strength come from? Who are we turning to? Who are we relying on? Who gives us this source of strength for us as Christians? Because that's an important thing that we need to talk about when the world is in turmoil, when lots of things are going on, but even when we're not undergoing persecution or turmoil or problems, this is still a question that we need to continually examine and ask ourselves. And Paul kind of is addressing this situation all throughout the book of Ephesians, but especially as he's getting close to wrapping up the book there in Ephesians chapter 6. So if you'll turn with me in Ephesians chapter 6 there, we can see what Paul talks about is supposed to be the source of our strength and how important this is. In Ephesians 6 there, beginning in verse 10, Paul writes to the Ephesian brethren saying, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Our strength as Christians should come from God, should come from Christ, not our own power, not our own ability, not our own learning. It comes from God himself. That's the important and that's the focus here. That's what we're supposed to be looking at here. His strength, when you go back to the beginning of the chapter that he kind of opens the book with, is far beyond our own. It goes so much more beyond our capabilities and our abilities. When you look there in Ephesians chapter 1 there in verse 19, we can see this echoed again. And what is Paul talking about Christ here? What is his exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power with which he worked in Christ. His strength is so much stronger than anything we could help to accomplish, than anything we could have hoped to do. That's Paul's message here to the Ephesian brethren, as it has been to many other churches that he has written to. He recognizes there in Ephesians chapter 3, still continuing with the same theme and this same thought, that one of the greatest blessings that we have as Christians is Christ and his strength that he gives us. My prayer to them, as he's talking there in verse 16, is that he would grant to you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit and the inner man. That's been Paul's prayer for Ephesus, for Timothy, for Titus, for Corinth, for so many of these churches. That they pray, that they recognize that Christ is our greatest blessing and source of strength. And it can far exceed anything we could ever hope or ask for. Sometimes when we preached on this a couple weeks ago when we talked about power in prayer and asking God too little. But his strength we recognize over and over throughout the Old and New Testament can far exceed what we ask. We like to put limits sometimes in our mind in what God can do and what he can help us through and what he can give us strength to, to accomplish and come through and pull through. Paul recognizes, listen, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. You know, sometimes we ask God to do things or help with things or help with prayer or sickness or struggle or our mental well-being. And we put limits on God sometimes thinking, I can't accomplish much. I can't do much. And by doing so, we also limit Christ. Paul is saying Christ is able to do exceedingly abundantly, which in and of itself is a powerful phrase, but he continues on, exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or even think. Christ has a power that we cannot even begin to fathom. He has a help. He has a strength that is so far beyond our own. And without him, we wouldn't be able to accomplish or overcome nearly as many things as what we're able to without him. Paul says, if you want to get access to this strength, and he is, should be, and will be the source of that strength, if you will let him. There in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul continues the thought there in verse 11. If you want access to this strength, Paul says, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. And so we're going to talk here in just a moment about what it means to put on the armor of God. But before we do that, Paul places some emphasis here in verse 11 on why we need Christ's strength. 
Because sometimes we look at our own strength, we look at our own abilities and capabilities and think, I can get by fine on my, on my own. Sometimes we get prideful in thinking, I don't need anybody else. Men, we tend to have this problem a little bit more so than women. But as human beings, we all struggle with this. That we think, I can, I can do this on my own. I can withstand whatever comes my way. I'll, I'll be able to tough it out. I'll be able to be okay. But Paul says here, we need to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand the wiles, the craftiness of the devil. Because he is assaulting us in every way that he possibly can. If you turn with me back to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 there, Paul talks about this again with the Corinthian brethren, this same mindset there in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11. Paul warns the Corinthian brethren that they need to be watchful lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Paul's writings here, both to the Ephesian brethren, is the same as to the Corinthian brethren, that Satan is crafty. Again, he uses this term wiles and craftiness and devices because Satan's going to use every underhanded tactic in his playbook that he can against us. And so some of the things that we need to be watchful for, just to name a few, Paul talks about there again, if you turn over just a little bit further in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, there beginning in verse 2, Paul talks about some of Satan's wiles in the ability to make people blind, to cause them not to realize the situations that they're in. 2 Corinthians 4, beginning there in verse 2, Paul writes, We have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Paul is again writing here talking about some of Satan's craftiness and devices and how many have been fooled by him. How many, he says, are currently still walking in shame and in the craftiness and are being fed God's word deceitfully in a twisted way ruined form. These are the people, Paul says, that have been subject to the God of this earth. He's talking about Satan here, not actually Jehovah, but the God of this age, this Satan who has so much power over people on this earth and that has made them blind to their situation. This is why Paul says we need Christ's strength. He's the only one that can actually give us the light to be able to realize that we've even been walking in darkness, that we've been struggling, and that we need help. But another one of Satan's tactics, if you turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 4, again, Paul talking to Timothy about some of the issues that are facing the church and could face Timothy himself. If he is not cautious, there in 2 Timothy 4, I'm sorry, first Tim, 2 Timothy chapter 4, I'm in 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning there in verse 1, Paul writes, <clears throat> I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers." They will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Paul describes a people who Satan has seared their hearts. <laughs> that the gospel no longer penetrates or affects them. That they would rather hear things that are pleasing to them, that tickle their ears, that provoke them and invoke them to other attitudes and ways of thinking. Paul's saying we need to be watchful for this. He has wiles that will prick us to our very heart just as God's word will, but where God's word will soften our heart and cause us to grow, Satan's wiles are striving to harden and sear our heart as with a hot iron so that it becomes callous to this point of being past feeling. We need to be watchful for these things. This is why we need Christ's strength so that we can take him that we can use his power, that we can use his strength to withstand the wiles of the devil. 
He has wiles there in Ephesians chapter 2. Again, back at our main chapter in the same church we've been talking about here, there in Ephesians chapter 2, back up there to chapter 2 beginning in verse 1, Paul talks about this attitude with the brethren as well there in Ephesus. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, in whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as others. Paul is saying, listen, Satan has worked on you and worked on me before. And where he has lured us away from God's blessings, from righteousness, and caused us to walk with these children of wrath. And brethren, he's saying, there are still those that are walking in that that have been taught the truth. The way that you can resist these things, that you can turn away from these things, is to put on Christ's strength. There's a temptation there, if you turn back there in Romans chapter 6, verse 15 and 16, to become lazy with God, with the gospel and God's word. Sometimes Satan isn't so much working to stop you from becoming a Christian. Sometimes he's working on people who have already put on Christ's strength, but then they become lazy to put on the whole armor of God, and they stop growing and stop putting it on. There in Romans 6 and verse 15, beginning, what then, Paul writes, are we to sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? Satan's temptation there is to stop you from being a servant of God. Satan's temptation there is perfectly satisfied with you calling yourself a Christian, a child of God, a servant of God, and you just being satisfied with that title alone and doing nothing. If that's what his temptation gets you to do, Satan is perfectly happy there. Because you're a soldier, you're a servant that is useless, and in reality, you're serving him without realizing it. We need Christ's strength to recognize, as Paul says there, we've presented ourselves to God as obedient servants that we're going to serve him, that we're going to obey him, that we're going to give everything that we have in order to serve our new master. While the old one is tempting us and telling us, no, you can put these things aside. We need to recognize Satan is using his wiles to make us even forget that he even exists. Sometimes it's hard to remember the influence, and we just noticed four points previously, of the influence that Satan can have on us and on the world. But Paul even writes about this when we go back to our main section of Scripture there in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. Paul reminds them of the importance of putting on the armor of God, because in verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Part of Satan's goal is to make us forget that he even exists. To forget about the power and the influence that he can have on us and the rest of this world. And Paul's reminded the brethren, listen, Satan's not going to manifest himself as physical flesh and blood before you that you're wrestling against. He's going to use his wiles his cunning, his devices with principalities, with powers, with everything at his disposal to make us not want to put on the armor of God and turn to Christ for strength. We don't know in all the ways how God's providence works, but we can recognize it. In a similar manner, we don't know in every single way how Satan will use all of his wiles and devices. And there are things that we do not understand about Satan and his demons and those that work with him. And that's okay. Because Paul is writing here, listen, you don't have to understand everything about Satan, about how he and his followers and his fellow demons work. You just need to know that he is real that he is dangerous. And if you want to stand against him, you need to use the strength. You need to take up the whole arsenal to fight him that Satan, I'm sorry, that Christ is giving you. 
Because Satan is using his old arsenal. He is using those principalities. He is using those powers. He is using the rulers of the darkness of the age. And he's using the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. I don't understand what all of that means or how all of that works. We get little glimpses in the scripture of the ways in which God allows Satan to tempt us and try to harm us. I don't understand how all of that works, but it does and it is. And we need to be watchful of these things. We need to take up our whole arsenal to stand against him. That's why in verse 13 of Ephesians chapter 6, Therefore Paul commends us again, Take up the whole armor of God, armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. We need Christ's strength. We need his armor so that we can take an active role in standing against Satan. These are the things that we're called to do. These are the things that we're called to stand against. And then Paul begins to talk about the nature, the abilities, the blessings that we can find in this armor of God. So let's begin there in Ephesians chapter 6 there in verse 13 and 14. Ephesians chapter 6 there in verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. In verse 14, he starts there and talks about the belt of truth. Verse 14, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. The importance there being placed. Listen, you can take this belt, you can take this gird, you can take this binding of truth that holds everything together. When he's talking about taking elements of Christ's strength and his gospel and his power and donning it like a suit of armor so that we can be able to withstand him, he's talking about the importance of truth. There in a similar passage in John chapter 8, there in verse 32 through 34, Jesus talks to his disciples and tells them, And you will know but the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered and said to him, We are the offspring of Abraham, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say we will become free? But Jesus answered and said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever practices sin is a slave to sin. The Jewish and the disciples that he was there and preaching to there in John chapter 8 were really struggling with even putting on the first part of the armor. They couldn't take truth and they couldn't wrestle with it and they couldn't put it on as part of this armor. They're struggling here with even the first step. He says, listen, if you take truth, you'll know everything. Truth will set you free. It's the first step here. We talk about the five steps of salvation same ideas really present there when we talk about hearing the word of God. You have to take that truth, and that's the start of binding everything together. Without it, everything subsequently that we're about to talk about with the rest of this armor is going to fall apart. It's not going to stand. So the importance of this girdle of truth that girds your waist is important. It holds everything together. And then secondly, he continues on in that same verse having put on the breastplate of righteousness. God talks about the importance of righteousness here in guarding our hearts. Remember, we talked about there in 2 Timothy chapter 4, there verses 1 through 3, of one of the wiles of Satan is to prick us to our hearts, but to prick us in our hearts in such a way so that we're seared as with a hot iron, so that we become past the point of feeling. Righteousness, he is talking about here, is like a breastplate. It guards our hearts. It uses it as this idea that David talks about in Psalm 119 and verse 11, where he talks about the idea, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That when we take this righteousness, when we take the truth, when we take God's word, when we meditate on it, when we dwell on it, when we store it in our heart, it makes it that much harder for Satan to pierce us through and sear our conscience and our heart as with a hot iron. That's the importance he's placing here on this. This is the nature of Christ's strength that it's starting to cover the more and more we get into this, every area in which Satan tries to attack. When you get there into verse 15, if you continue on reading there with me, Ephesians chapter 6 there in verse 15, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The idea that we talked about there back in there in verse 13, you put on the whole armor God that you may be able to withstand him in the evil day and having done all to stand. 
This gospel of peace is the very foundation on which we stand. It's, like he says, our boots. It's what we latch up and it's what we tie on to get ready to go to war against Satan. It's the same idea that gives Paul the ability, like in Romans chapter 1 there in verse 16, to make such statements as, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The righteous will take the gospel. They will take God's word. They will take his power. They will take Christ's strength. And it will help them stand for and in the truth. That's why he's saying you need to put on the whole armor of God. None of these pieces can be held back. Then he gets on into faith. When he talks about Ephesians 6 there in verse 16. Above all, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Again, when we talk about faith, sometimes we talk about this idea of blind faith. That, no, I, I just need to believe whatever God says, and I just need to ignore whatever Satan is saying. In some way, that's commendable, but that's not all he's talking about here. What he's talking about here, when you start taking up the shield, when you start taking up faith, when you're wanting to protect yourself, from the wiles and fiery darts of everything that Satan can sometimes overwhelm us with, that we can be able to put up our faith, that we can place our hope and our trust in God. And we just did a study of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 not too long ago. But we can take the faith that God has given us and we can be protected from Satan's assaults. In that, Satan may throw a lot of doubts, he may throw questions, he may assault us in so many ways with all of his devices and wiles. But we can put our faith in God to know, listen, as long as I'm doing what I need to, as long as I'm putting on the whole armor of God, as long as I'm relying on him for strength, then God is happy with me and God will take care of me. A shield is not an ultimate protection against Satan's wiles. Sometimes, fiery darts get around the shield and fell soldiers. And people die. But they still held on to that faith and they're still called a good and faithful servant and soldier by our Lord and Master. It's the nature of God's strength there that even if we're fighting to our dying breath because we're trying to stand, we're guarding what's important, we're going against Satan's assault, Sometimes we will die doing that. But Paul's commendation again here is we have done all to stand in all of our power. Then he continues on with another piece of the armor in verse 17. Take up the helmet of salvation, which is the hope of salvation. There in Ephesians chapter 16, he's talking about this helmet because it protects our minds. When you think of a helmet in a modern day sense or in a medieval sense when they're putting on helmets, it's to protect the brain, it's to protect the head. There's a metal helmet and there's often a lot of padding and everything in there that's trying to protect you as much as possible from damaging one of your most important organs. It's, with, it's wherein everything else works together. And in that same attitude, he's talking about that, this idea, this helmet of salvation, this hope of salvation protects our minds against the mental assault Satan can send against us. Because remember, Satan's trying every thing, every attitude, every while, every device in his playbook. And if he can't get you at your heart, he can't get you to sin, if he can get you to doubt, if he can get you to fear, if he can get you to cower, if he can get you to give up on your self-control, then he wins. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7, Paul writes to Timothy, God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, of love, of self-control. This is another part of this nature and the strength that we have to take up from Christ, that we're able to look at his word, at the things Christ has done for us, at the promises that he has given us that we can overcome Satan and all of his devices, that we're not a people afraid to, we're not a people at cowering in fear. We're standing against Satan. Not 
hiding, afraid of the devices and things he can use against us. No, we're out there standing against God with every power that we have. And then, getting close to the end here with this arsenal, again in verse 17, take up the helmet of salvation, which is the hope of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is our offense that we use as part of this army. Not that we're taking up the Bible and beating people over the head with it. Not in the sense that we're assaulting people with Scripture, but in the sense that Paul talks about, or whoever the Hebrew writer was in Hebrews chapter 4 there in verse 12, the Word of God is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces through even to the division of the soul and of the spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thought and intentions of the heart. Just like we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, we're not picking up a physical weapon that we can use to assault people. We're picking up God's word to try and pierce through the calloused hearts that Satan has seared. We're trying to reach past people who thought they were past the point of feeling, of caring about their salvation, of caring about righteousness, and trying to prick their hearts so that God's word can become an influence on them, so that it can change them and shape them just as you and I have been changed and shaped for those of us here that are listening that are Christians. It's the same attitude that we saw in Acts chapter 2. The mobs surrounding Peter and the apostles in Acts chapter 2, many of them were there on the day Christ was crucified. Some of those standing there, when Peter is preaching that first gospel sermon of the New Testament, are standing there as people that yelled, that spat, that cried out, crucify him. And it was some of those same people that Luke records for us in Acts chapter 2 that are recorded as being pricked to the heart and crying out to Peter and the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Because previously Satan had helped sear their heart and they didn't care that they were killing the Messiah and the Son of God. But now that callus has been pierced by a sword that is sharper than anything that man can ever make. This too is part of Christ's strength that is part of the armor of God that we have to stand up to, that we have to take up, that we may stand against the wiles of the devil. One of the things we don't talk about very often when we talk about the, the armor of God picks up there as well in verse 18. Part of this as well. Praying... And always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. Another weapon, another tool in this armor of God and our arsenal is prayer. Sometimes we stop at the sword and say, okay, now we've described all the armor pieces, but part of being a good soldier is also the idea of remaining vigilant of remaining watchful, recognizing that as long as we're alive, the war has not stopped. Satan is still out there. He is still crafty. He is still using every device, wile, spirit, host, and everything else that he can use in his arsenal against you, against me, and against our other fellow soldiers. So Paul's prayer for the Ephesian brethren and his command for them is to be prayerful not only for yourself, that you be watchful, but that you also pray for all the saints, all the other soldiers that are taking up the armor of God. It's the same attitude Peter talked about in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Many of you can quote it. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. The idea of being vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. It's another important piece of our armory. That we remain watchful. That we keep the armor on. That we keep using it. 
It's the source of our strength. It does us no good if we lay it down and don't use it. It does us no good if we only take it up every once in a while. The moment we take it off, the moment we set God's word aside, the moment we stop relying on Christ's strength is when Satan will assault us the hardest. We need to put on this whole armor of God because it's the very source of our strength. I'll end with the same verse that we started with this morning. Back in Ephesians chapter 6, back up there to verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power mm -hmm. of his might. Brethren, I asked you this morning, what is the source of our strength? We can find strength in our loved ones and our brethren, and our spouses, and our friends, and our brethren. We should find strength in them. They're a wonderful blessing and a help. But the true source of our strength needs to come from God. It's with his power that we'll be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, against everything that Satan in this world has to offer and throw at us. And we are promised with his strength we can and will overcome. Doesn't mean we won't lose our life. Doesn't mean we won't see hardships. Doesn't mean there won't be losses. But if we take up the whole armor of God, if we put it to use, and if we serve him faithfully, we can withstand the devil, and he will be there beside us, fighting this war as long as we live. And in the end, we are promised that he will overcome. And his soldiers that are serving him will be victorious. If Christ is not the source of your strength because you're not a Christian this morning, you are missing out on the greatest blessing of strength, of hope, of comfort, of protection of courage that any of us can ever gain access to. If that's the case this morning, why don't you start putting on the armor of God? That starts with step one by serving him faithfully. You've heard the gospel. You've heard the truth. If you have questions, we'd be happy to answer you. But if as God's word, as his sword is intended, has pricked your heart. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, then it's time to repent of your sins, to confess him as your Lord and Savior, and to be baptized this morning. If there is a need for that this morning, speak up. We will happily meet up with you, and we will baptize you, and we will rejoice that another soul has been saved. And at least... For the moment, one of Satan's wiles has been defeated and we have rescued another good soldier, another friend, another family member from his devices and clutches. The case may be this morning that you are a soldier of God, but you have not been putting the armor to use. You have let Satan's wiles get in. You have let him prick your conscience to the point that you're past feeling and you don't care about sin. Perhaps you've given up that hope of salvation and the hope and the peace that he promises you and you're cowering and living in fear this day. There's an avenue of escape. If you're afraid to stand for the truth, to be a good soldier and servant of him, through whatever means Satan has used that has convinced you not to take up the whole armor of God and not be useful for him, then this morning repent if it is of a public nature that is brought shame upon the church the command there is to confess those things before the brethren and God will be faithful to forgive you we will pray with you and we will help you we will pray for you just as we read a moment ago that you'll return that you'll be watchful and that you will help us remain watchful until the last day of this earth and until the end of our lives.
we remain faithful, we stand against the lies of the devil. Whether you start the journey this day, whether you return, or whether these things have helped strengthen and hearten you so that you'll be better able to serve him this week, this year, this month than you have in the past, then take up the whole armor of God and let him be that source of your strength. Whatever the case may be this morning, if there is a need for something to be said, for prayers of the saints, or to be baptized, speak up now. If not, we'll wrap up our lesson here. We'll end off with a word of closing prayer.